uh, but now I'm actually uh, excited to uh, start the panel discussion and invite you uh, on a stage just for a couple of uh, people that we're going to see the names uh, just over here a second. So Oleg, uh, I'm happy to invite you back here. Uh, then Maria uh, and Lars as well. Uh, sadly, Sten, uh, who was supposed to be here from the Estonian Innovation, uh, Estonian Ministry of Education and uh, uh, Research. Uh, you know, it's uh, November, uh, so people get sick sometimes. Uh, so he sadly uh, wasn't able to join us today, but uh, we will try to, you know, replace him a bit. And Maria, you can uh, we can have a bit of a, you know, a, oh yeah, you can come closer to me as well. That's fine. All right. Um, so we already talked about uh, again a lot about like also the teachers and and their readiness as well. Um, so maybe I will I will kick it off and and, and kind of have a round here. Um, so in terms of. Uh, their readiness. Are educators prepared to integrate also AI into their teaching? And what are the most critical areas for training teachers um, on AI tools? And Maria, maybe, you know, starting from, uh, from that side here. What's yeah. your kind of a, a view on that side? Oh, well, I have the privilege to have a perspective both from Finland, as you can see the little Finnish flag there, but also from the US. So um, I'm kind of based in both countries. I go back and forth and I think there are similar trends over there as there are here. There's just such a wide gap between the most proficient teachers of today and those that are far, far, far behind. Um, so, and, and I think this is largely correlated with where the schools are located. So typically capital cities um, have, have greater resources and more skilled teachers, and that's not so in the rural areas. So that's something to account for, that the skills gap, gap has this kind of a regional dependency as well. But if you especially compare, you said you have an experience from the US side and now as is this conference, especially focusing on the Nordic and Baltic side, do you think there is a big difference also in terms of like, you know, comparing to, to readiness in terms of the countries and, and having that wide knowledge in, in these senses? I think we are doing a lot better here in Europe in terms of standardizing education, having a lot of uh, resources available to the teachers. So even though they don't necessarily have the individualized skills to come up with these programs, they have a whole backbone of things that are provided by the ministries and, and other government bodies to kind of fall back on. I think that's far lacking in the U.S. for sure. But, but Lars, actually, uh, to continue on your side as well here, uh, you know, uh, your perspective in terms of like, how might AI redefine uh, the role of teachers in a, in a classroom as well? Oleg was talking about this, this thing mm. already in his presentation, but your point of view as well here. Yeah, I think that um, AI is a double-edged sword, so we have to know the, the limitations of it. Uh, but I also think that it can enable teachers to get further in a short period of time. But the issue here is that how do you validate that uh, if you create assignments for, for the students or uh, the attending people here, how can you validate the output of it? Um, and I think that actually requires that us as teachers, we know the field very in depth because how can we validate what the AI is teaching us? Uh, so in, in terms of that, I, I think, you know, us as teachers, we should have the same critical thinking as uh, the students should have, actually. But um, yeah, I, I think it can help us in order to to create the assignments faster. But in Denmark, are there any kind of initiatives also from uh, from the public sector side coming, you know, kind of supporting the teachers in terms of like understanding this better? Because even like, so m I've been working in the Estonian governmental sector for the last seven years time as well. And, and when we were even like, you know, creating the AI Act and getting like the feedback on, 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 on this as well, there were a lot of people that, you know, have been working in the governmental sector for a little while already and maybe even lack of, of the knowledge itself as well. And I think it's kind of the same reflection also in terms of like the school and the teachers that they might not even understand that technology. Is, is Denmark somehow also supporting the process of like, you know, are there any, any I don't know, courses that, that are especially meant for, for the teachers in order to, to, to support them with this? Not that I'm aware of in the time of speaking here. Um, there are initiatives in the organizations where we try to look at, okay, is this safe? Can we use it in a safe manner? Um, and then Companies essentially go buy into to co-pilot with uh, Office 365, and then we know that there are some some issues re in regards to that. Are the data that we share with the AI is that private? Is this something that um, 
yeah, we are in control of. And if uh, if not so, then we can buy into private uh, AIs. But are they really that private? I think there is like a gap there where we have to define, are there any controls? Are there any limitations we can put in in order to, to share uh, yeah, the data and what do we share actually. I think this is such an important point. We're looking at kind of we need teachers not only with, with skills in identifying opportunities for AI, but also with skills in understanding the risks with AI. And those are very different domains. <laughs> so where can we apply AI and how do we apply it safely? Those are very, very important yeah. domains to develop. Uh, like uh, from, from your point of view as well, like you already covered, especially for the teaching method side as well. But uh, when I when I started with my opening remarks as well here, I talked about like the four million uh, also shortages in terms of like the uh, the skills not the skills, but the, but like workforce in uh, and, and globally, uh, it's it's a huge number. I think if I was correct, it's a bit less than one million here in Europe, and the number is is uh, increasing as we speak, right? Um, so in terms of like using AI, do you think that? that is going to be the tool for the future, uh, really helping us uh, a bit with, with like this shortage in, in terms of like the workforce as well. Well, in general, <clears throat> in general, I'm very optimistic. So I think that it is uh, a mighty lever uh, what could help teachers uh, to save time, uh, to do more, uh, to be more efficient and so on and so on. But we have to understand that, I mean, we have to uh, work hard in order to make it happen. So uh, you asked, I mean, about this uh, readiness of the teachers and the level of uh, education for them, for teachers. So it's a very important question. So uh, I'm not so much, I don't have so many concerns with regards to readiness. I think that they're ready mm -hmm. uh, to, uh, to dive deep in this area. But we have to understand that, 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 that educating of teacher, this is teachers in this particular situation, this is something that is absolutely unprecedented. So, because we have to do it in several layers. So uh, we have to talk not only about the technology and even technology, even technology. I mean, that's a matter of the opportunities and threats, exactly like Maria said as well, right? But it's, uh, it's a matter of methodology. So for example, this flip classroom. So uh, the way how you are acting in front of class, together with the class and so on and so on. So it has to be changed. And from that point of view, I would say that uh, quite a lot of those skills what teachers uh, used to use up to so far, uh, uh, they will be less useful right now, and we have to kind of, to, to a certain extent, to relaunch the way how teachers are acting. So from that point, it is absolutely unprecedented what mm -hmm. we have to do. Mm -hmm. uh, but in terms of like going back now, maybe to the awareness of, of you, uh, the, the students themselves as well. Uh, I mean, you have an experience also with, with you know, few kids, and uh, and in terms of like. Um, do you have any examples that you can share with us uh, of the AI-based tools that can make actually cybersecurity uh, learning more kind of accessible and at the same time also engaging to the students as well? Because like in a lot of ways, people think that it's just tech uh, and, and, and they, they feel also a bit of a, uh, that it's so far from them and then it's not so maybe interesting to be engaged. And if you think about like these uh, young kids that are, you know, doing theoretical hacking just next to us here uh, and, and going around in this room and, and seeing, you know, how excited they are to be part of this. Like, do you also have any kind of an examples or the tools that you really have seen uh, that are working well with, uh, with kids? I can start. Um, so we've been actually uh, piloting CyberCoach in schools. And that's not something um, we, we were very cognizant of the fact that we're like a chat based learning platform, which is great for adults in the workplace. Adults don't necessarily miss these hyper visual, you know, music led games that, that kids are playing. So we thought that for kids, this is going to be so boring. They're not going to like this. But actually, kids seem to be really intrigued by it. And it's like, what's happening next? And it's just such a kind of unfamiliar format to them that it's already intriguing. So we're not even competing in the same category of all of the Minecrafts and and uh, whatnots they're playing on on their devices, but but in a, in a whole whole new category, and that's that's intriguing. So I think kids, kids are very malleable, and they're very kind of eager to try new things and learn le learn in different ways. And I think that the uniqueness about CyberCoach is that we can provide the kids an anonymous learning environment as well, mm -hmm. so they don't have to fear that okay, I'm going to make a mistake here, and now my friends know or my teacher knows. It's all safe and and kind of. Um, Fun, fun way of learning. So we've had good, good experiences with that uh, in, in schools and in kind of different kind of format compared to their day-to-day. -day. Mm -hmm. Lars? Yeah, well, I come from a security company as well. So we try to teach uh, the, the youngsters out there, and that would be in, in all ages, what, what 
are the dangers of this. And uh, what we're looking into here is also uh, what are the deep fakes uh, on the internet right now. And and that goes back to what we just saw with uh, Caddy, just to to think critically of where where data comes from and where where it is and what kind of power that it puts in. Because um, right now that we have seen in Denmark, we have regulated against um, uh, artificial created porn that you know where people are put in with uh, creating deep fakes in that sense so so that uh, is something we're starting to regulate but we also show what what dangers can be in that area here mm -hmm. because right now there are tools out there already available in the time of speaking here where you can do these things so so putting that into perspective and also putting that into a learning to say okay what are the advantages and also what are the dangers for it because it it goes both ways in my mind mm -hmm. like uh, with regards to students, uh, I think that um, the biggest uh, threat what we are facing right now, this is something what I mentioned in my uh, speech as well, the biggest threat uh, is uh, the temptation for students to start to outsource the thinking process. And we have to uh, tackle it, we have to deal with that. So, I mean, it's uh, um, in terms of students, I would maybe put uh, the uh, laser sharp focus not so much on technology, but on critical thinking, on metacognition. I mean, it's explaining that thinking is fun, and, and it's, I mean, it's, 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 it's just great to do to think, you know. So, uh, and, uh, and to, uh, to st because it's, this is something where we are still better than machines are especially if we are talking kind of this about the capacity of building the uh, the bridges uh, in interdisciplinary areas from chemistry to biology from biology to physics and so on as so we are still better than machines and will be in a foreseeable future better than machines here but it assumes that we know how to think mm. it assumes that we have certain skills and desire to think critically yeah. but also cr the creativity can potentially die out over time Absolutely. because if people don't learn to think and and be creative you know then then creativity will die over time uh, in the worst manner yeah. absolutely so, so our audience can also join the conversation by you know asking uh, questions we already have received also already one question as well that i also personally very much like here um so uh we need superhuman teachers for AI uh, in area where, uh, where they are struggling to find, where we are struggling uh, to find teachers overall. How can AI maybe be attractive to bring youth into teaching? How do we attract more, uh, again, younger people into the field of teaching, becoming a teacher? I mean, Oleg, you are working as a teacher today as well. Um, how can we get more young people and, and would AI be able to somehow help us as well in that terms? Well, you know, this question starts from the uh, statement what is already questionable. So we need super teachers, right? So uh, I would uh, kind of, I would rather put the focus on the fact that, that uh, let's, uh, let's create the situation environment where we are facing the gradual transition, small steps one by one. So small steps, how to change the way how we are teaching today. So uh, I do argue that a lot of teachers who are today in front of class, as we speak, they're right now staying in front of class. They are a capable and willing to do that. So let's just kind of to leverage them in that, right? And then uh, we will face uh, the reality where the life will be kind of better every single day with that. And, and you also, I mean, I'm going to stick with, with Oleg for one more second here as well. Um, we, we discussed also before about like, you know, using AI as, as, as kind of a grading of her assessments as well. Uh, what are the biggest kind of, uh, you know, pros and cons in terms of using AI to assess uh, student performances as well? Are you, are you doing this already by, by you know, implementing some, somehow the AI methods too? No, we are not using AI anyhow for yeah. grading or assessments, uh, absolutely consciously. It's a matter of models today, and uh, there are, I mean, at least I have not seen any trustful models for that. Mm. So uh, it doesn't mean that uh, there are no such kind of models, but at least I have not seen such kind of models. Uh, but, uh, but at the same time, uh, it can, again, so the decision should be, I mean, we, we, we have to be in a situation that decision is done by human. Right, so uh, the AI could provide certain data, data room, whatever, but decisions should be done by human. So where AI is better than we are today is grabbing and maybe combining and, and layering all this data, what is needed, but human should be the person who is making the decision. 
what's your point, Maria, in terms of like we, we discussed when we had a, you know, off the stage a talk about this as well. And you said that you also see that there might be a punch potential, but like in terms of like how we can we answer in a way that it's it's not uh, uh, like that it's it's fair and it's unbiased as well. So many of you in this room already might be aware, but this is actually one of the use cases that the EU AI Act aims to regulate, uh, thankfully, <laughs> since it's a pretty damn scary area. <laughs> Pardon my my French. Um, so, so it will be considered a high-risk AI model and it will have specific requirements around transparency and safety uh, and ethics uh, that are transcribed in the law already today. So that's something that I'm very, very, very happy about because as a cybersecurity professional, it's so easy to see where this is going wrong. Um, I mentioned uh, how we're already seeing the technology hallucinating today. So for me, uh, finding those ways to ensure that whenever, we're, even, even as a decision support, we cannot be giving those teachers inaccurate data. It, it can't do what ChatGPT and the other likes are doing today, that they're even misrepresenting percentages from materials, which I have referenced in my yeah. talk. Uh, so we're going to need to fix that problem, and we're going to need to get a lot better at it before we can use that. But at the same time we understand teachers are overworked so the more we can automate like these mundane tasks teachers have and and figure out where they can actually get creative and add value uh, that's also going to help us get new teachers into the industry because it's no longer going to be about this just standing in front of a classroom <laughs> classroom there's going to be much more diverse methods for uh, teaching children and, and uh, making use of technology mm -hmm. but but I also think that in, in order to support the newcomers, because I think all the young kids that we're seeing here uh, sitting next to us, these are the new generations that we also need to support. And for me as an old timer in this business, I would to to give them that support in order to say, okay, what is valid data sources? How can we validate this? But then AI can help them express uh, what they want to re represent for, for the rest of the, the classroom. So I, I strongly believe that... that um, the, to to minimize the hallucinations that you are talking about, Maria, then you know that is my job, uh, and then AI can help express uh, what they would like to to do in in the future. So I think that that uh, the presentation, the wording, all that that can AI help with uh, help us with. Mm -hmm. So the research can be helped with with the old timers to say the least. And it's great at creating like like we make use of in CyberCoach these conversational interfaces because chat based learning is actually really effective. There's a lot of science that goes beyond like a lot of science behind that that we learn through dialogue, not so much mm -hmm. through passively watching videos. It's learning peer to peer to, through dialogue is really effective and that's something that large language models can enable at scale. So that's that's one of the opportunities that that are exciting here. Yeah. We we also received one question that um, that uh, came from the audience as well. Um, in, in terms of, uh, there has been a lot of discussions uh, that EU likes to regulate a lot of things. I mean, in, in some ways, very positively, where we talked about, again, that uh, we uh, can somehow also the manage the risk aspect there when we have the right laws, preventions, and, and, and so on. Um, so the question uh, um, is, uh, how, can, how can we help EU become a more innovative, less defensive actor in the cyber arena and countering strategic disadvantages in a dangerous geopolit geopolitical environment? Anybody wants to take that one? That how is actually we... a good question. Yeah. Um, and I think that when we look at, at how does that work today in, in the businesses, uh, the first thing that comes into my mind is that the Center for Internet Security, that is a collaboration uh, where you have a lot of good practices being bought brought out to the to the masses and I think a similar uh, thing should be created here and that should be based in the different countries to to make a, a group that that collects all the knowledge that is collected in that sense and then being centralized in Europe somehow um, I, I think the answer is simple but then again yet sophisticated it, it, one of the important yes, answers as well is education. I mean, we're talking about education a lot today, but that's one of the solutions here mm -hmm. because today, I mean, we, we're electing people to make these big decisions that are going to have very far-reaching consequences for an, our entire society. So the, so the more our general public, every citizen has the skills to evaluate their skills and get really skillful individuals into these decision-making positions, the better better are, we will be uh, positioned as a society, the more resilient we're going to be as a society against all this. 
but I think it, yeah, sorry. Regulation is not necessarily bad, right? So uh, mm -hmm. as long as you are involving real experts to the process. So uh, if we just uh, can ensure the fact that the real experts, those who understand what is happening in this area, those are involved in creating the regulation, that regulation could be very... Uh, we have seen an, in Europe a lot of examples of regulation what has a positive impact, mm -hmm. right? Absolutely. Uh, but but in terms of like, we, we focused a bit on, on the EU side and regulating and everything. Are there any countries that we should look up for uh, outside of the EU that really has find that kind of a balance there in terms of, again, including AI more into, you know, uh, also in an ed as an educational system and, and for the cybersecurity sense? Because, you know, uh, my background, again, from the defense uh, sector side was always that we were looking into what the Singapore is doing, also, you know, Israel and their methods in order to implement the AI models into teaching the cybersecurity skills and so on. Have you have you seen any any good also examples on a on a national level somewhere that really has worked and, and where like EU should also look outside for as well? I think we're so immature in regulating this new technology that there aren't really like the EU AI Act is really a landmark law in this sense globally. And I mean if you look at GDPR, the privacy side regulation. I mean, it took US eight years <laughs> and we're now coming up with national <laughs> privacy laws and we're of course copycatting a lot <laughs> from the European laws. So, so I think EU is actually leading the game in terms of regulation in this space. Uh, there are innovations in terms of using the technology, but I think uh, we need to think before we use it. <laughs> so I think this approach where we're already, I guess, a few years late with the with the regulation, but at least it's coming now <laughs> and, and perhaps it will... Um, have a positive impact before we get too deep into using this technology everywhere in our society. I totally agree with that because I think this have actually exploded for the past two years. Yeah. Uh, ChatGPT Copilot has just reached the market. And, and when that reaches the masses, I think that that is where you put the power into the people's hands. And then we have to see, okay, what will this uh, Im implode in, uh, or Im implement in our society today? We, we haven't seen the top of the iceberg yet, I think. Mm. So, okay. so it, it, what we need is to, to build up some, some knowledge around that in order to, you know, start to regulate into it. I, I totally agree with that. So it's, uh, it's exactly the place where the ice is meeting with fire. So meaning the conservative system is meeting with, uh, with the, the age of innovation. Mm -hmm. And once again, so education should be conservative. So it's absolutely embedded inside the education, it should be uh, conservative. And education cannot just take every single technology what is appearing and say that it's for granted that let's start to use it. So it's a, we have to understand what is a better way to, to, uh, to implement the technology. So I think it's absolutely normal that today are, I mean, Estonia today is rather on the forefront, I, I truly believe that, in uh, trying to understand how to embed that. Uh, but uh, I have not seen any uh, any kind of uh, any countries that have already introduced some notions on governmental level. At least I have not seen them. But uh, but in terms of again, we, we talked about also a lot of kind of misunderstanding of AI and kind of the fear of of, of, of the AI. I think in both from the students' perspective and also from the, from the teachers' perspective as well. Do you have any kind of examples, like what really has worked? Is, is it just, again, uh, the simple answer, we should educate them more, they should understand this more, or, or just something from your kind of careers, your experience, that really has worked in order to get rid of this kind of a massive fear of the AI? Because when we, when we discussed with you after your, your keynote as well, the, the, uh, the, again, opportunity side and the threat side there as well, uh, how can we make sure that, again, there is, you know, not the fear, but actually seeing this as a chance of, of doing something better, doing something master, uh, faster and, and mastering your skills in, the, in that sense? Anybody? Any, any, any examples from... Uh I think there are some things that we don't fear enough. <laughs> I think Laris uh, brought, brought up the important uh, angle of the child sex abuse material and how it is, like a very real risk when we're just uploading kids' pictures into into these systems. Uh, that That is exploding, um, and that's something that we don't talk about enough, um, figuring out way to, ways to prevent that and prevent actual real-life harm, harm to children. But on the other hand, we also have these unfounded fears that are preventing our opportunities. So, so t teachers are afraid that, you know, they're going to be replaced by this technology. And as Oleg said, we are very, very far if like ever that would be possible <laughs> with with this technology it will be a great assistant a great co-pilot exactly as oleg said but it, it's not something that can replace 
yeah. humans, um, not, not, not for the foreseeable future. Well, in my experience, I've, I've noted that one of uh, few, several of my students have used, used it as a um, secretary service, as, as you know, writing the big text and then uh, changing that afterwards. So that can get the students faster uh, doing assignments. But then again, they also have to know how do we find the right answers. And I think sometimes, both as teacher but also as, as technology, we have to take a, a step back to say, okay, how do we find the real answers? And then we can use this as a sparring partner uh, to, to maybe ask questions to say, okay, how can I find solutions for this and that? And then we can uh, approve it or, or test it out uh, as normal education would be anyway. So, so testing it out and, and making the bulk work for us, basically. That can be the positive benefit. Yeah, just on, on positive examples, uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I had an example with one of my students. Uh, it's a middle school student, not a high school student. Uh, they faced a challenge with uh, just kind of square roots uh, type of exercises. And I showed to him, and it's very kind of introvert type of student, right? So it's, uh, he needs a time for himself. And he, I mean, uh, it's maybe to a certain extent, I mean, it's easier for him to, uh, to be alone and to, uh, to work with computer. And I showed to him how just with regards to kind of with uh, the uh, chat GPT app, what is in a phone, what is kind of what is able to speak with him, right? So you can just speak with it. Uh, how you can, uh, how it can guide you through the resolving of the exercises so that it's kind of, it's not giving you the solution but it's hinting you that what if you consider kind of taking this step now what if you consider taking this step and so on and so on and it's pretty gamified for a student and in a couple of days he came back and said oh I understand how it's uh, how it should be done because it's kind of it's again it's assistant what is uh, working in parallel with teacher and helping this particular student uh, using this technology what could we more imagine? Yeah, just for the, again, uh, the manual task and then things that are taking us a lot of time that replace them as well. You, you, this is exactly what we see with CyberCoach as well, like yeah. providing you're in that classroom yeah. and, and letting yeah. those introverts learn from kind of one-on-one -on -one yeah. environment as well. So kind of complementing the classroom learning with this kind of a more like... So, so kind of like a very personalized approach exactly. also. And I, I think that's something that is also very, very important because like in terms of like when I used to go to school, like everybody were like taught the same way, uh, but like we were so different and, and actually you needed much yeah. more of maybe a personalized approach. And I think that's also where AI can, can play a big uh, part as well. Yes. Uh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 just that we can have individual students already today choose that, okay, I want to learn from CyberCoach in a funny way, yeah. or I want to learn in a more serious way. I need more explanations. Mm -hmm. I need more help so we can adapt, use this technology, these large language models to really adapt to the individual skid, skid, kids' needs. So that's something that will profoundly, of course, affect um, being able to get all the kids on the same level, regardless of their backgrounds. Yeah. But I also think one of the positive things can be, as, as Oleg said, that rephrasing uh, the answers. So, yeah. you know, people learn differently. So if we can rephrase the, the answer or the, the, the questions a little bit different, that is where AI comes into play because you have a lot of data sets it's probably been, going to be trained on. So that has a lot of different wordings and, and uh, maybe teaching, let's say, programming, that would be a hard thing for a lot of people to, to learn and yet easy to, to get hands off. Uh, so you know, AI can actually speed up that process, I think. Mm -hmm. And I think also the language learning side as well, actually, uh, is, is something that in terms of like, you know, I also use like ChatGPT for like when you're like really in hurry and you need to write something very fast. And, and, and then like actually learning a lot of new words that I, I wouldn't use myself. And, and actually you go through that material and you learn a lot of things. And I, I know that also there are methods that you can use AI in terms of like, you know, having a conversation with you in mm -hmm. different languages as well. And, and you can set the tone again that there is a situation and that's the, uh, the tone I would like to uh, hear there as well. I like and uh, here comes one quite important point for students as well. So it's, I mean, it's absolutely okay if they are chat GPT. -ing. Mm -hmm. And there's absolutely okay if they are kind of asking chat GPT to do something for them. But what I'm uh, strictly against of is just copy pasting without understanding what was happening there. So it's, uh, I mean, if for example, in, in a classes of Python, uh, they are just kind of copy pasting certain pieces of the code and inserting in uh, yeah. Colab. I mean, that's not okay. But if you understand what exactly is happening there, so if you are able to, uh, I mean, this is something what we have to teach students to uh, to learn how to understand what uh, what have you got from there, and then you are learning by yourself as well. 
right. yeah, kind of structuring this by yourself as well. Because I think even like on the social media and even like receiving emails, I think all of you can agree that sometimes like you can really understand that this wasn't written by that person because there is a lot of things that like you you know are related to uh, the you know ChatGPT as well, and and then you know social media posts especially uh, that it's something that it doesn't sound natural. And I think for for the teachers as well that they can really identify when when this is not coming from from uh, from from their specific student when they don't speak that way and, and that way as well. So. Hiring today is a nightmare. <laughs> So everybody can sound like the perfect applicant by using these technologies. And I think another, uh, to this point, another good use case for um, all these language models today is that we can actually try to figure out, like, is, is what we're thinking actually new or is it something that everybody already knows? So if ChatGPT gives the answer, then you can pretty fairly establish that, okay, I had no new creative thinking here, but it's a nice way to kind of sound use it as a sounding board for your ideas mm-hmm. well, well normally if, if uh, some of my students would use AI I would probably ask them to say okay you got this from AI can you explain that what happened behind that <laughs> and that usually tends to put people off using that chat GBT because <laughs> that you know it, it removes the the actual problem solving here yeah. so but but I think having a, an, an attitude towards it It, we have to think of it. It's not here to go away soon. It's probably here to stay. So how can we work together with it in in order uh, to not, not combat it? Yeah, yeah against it. Against. Yeah. Like you. Yeah, what you mentioned. I mean, Annette, it's uh, it's one more kind of quite substantial danger uh, in the area of AI is that today the uh, cost of creating the content exponentially uh, goes down. So, I mean, it's in tens of times, right? Uh, it goes down. And as a result of that, we have an enormous, unprecedented amount of the trash content today, right? So again, mm-hmm. for us, it's I, I consider that rather as a smoke, uh, what is kind of around the fire is always some kind of smoke. Uh, but for us, again, it's rather an opportunity on that particular example to teach students how to understand, I mean, mm-hmm. what, is, uh, what is real information and what is just kind of some trash created yeah. content. I, I, I actually wanted to go in exactly that direction and talk about like a bit of like you know just some misinformation and especially you know towards the students and and things that we believe that we see online as well and and I just had a conversation I, I came from uh, Brazil yesterday and it was one of the companies that I met and they had a study trip to China and and we had a long conversation about using you know TikTok also for the educational level and and actually like a very heated discussion because I'm I'm very much against it and again everybody that are here in a room like I don't recommend as a cyber expert to have that application on your phone and and in, in terms of like again how we are being manipulated in terms of uh, teaching uh, that for Chinese students uh, they don't even have that application they have a complete different application very similar to uh, to TikTok as well and and then they are basically using TikTok for really educating their uh, their students and and for us the algorithms are completely something else And and I think we are really lacking today any kind of, you know, awareness raising in schools about, you know, because I think at least 90% of uh, students in schools have TikTok because this is so cool. And and, and, and and your classmates have, and you find a lot of information there that you think that might be true, but actually we're not capable of even understanding. And and, and so what, what do you think? How big of a challenge this is today and... and Are there any methods that we can uh, use also technology or schools to kind of fight against that? Because I feel like it's not just, it is actually a huge threat to our entire democracy, I, w- I would put it that sense. It's hugely, hugely important teaching children, not just like information li- literacy, but algorithmic li- literacy, being able to recognize these different um, information kind of influencing attempts at scale. Uh, what we have learned is that actually this kind of a anonymous technology that you chat with <laughs> can even be more credible uh, for, for children. So, uh, so what, what we do in like a co- company setting is we provide the platform for the company to train their employees, but they can also train their like employees' families with it. So we have a lot of data on this that uh, how children are using it and how how parents are learning it using the tool to educate um, themselves on how to educate their children. And there's a, the power in this combination. So you have a message coming from your teacher, you have the same message coming from your parents, and then kind of enforced by technology. Yeah. So you have it coming from different sources. So it's not just that, you know, it's my mom said this, and I don't like my mom, so I'm not going <laughs> to believe them, but I might be more inclined to believe uh, this technology. So kids, of course, are very different, but kind of having 
sa- multiple same sources of truth. I think that's mm-hmm. that can be powerful. A Danish well, example of maybe if as well. <laughs> well, I would say that the, a lot of the young kids that I've met uh, is lured into that algorithm because uh, you know it, AI might sift through what people like to look at and and how long with time we're looking at it. So I think that is actually one of the, the issues we have right now. But if we take a little bit uh, further to to look at what does um, the power of AI actually is or what the behind is. We we have an election going on in uh, the foreign countries right now and um, looking at uh, looking at the power that the, for the potential they have, uh, they say that they might change the output of the election and teaching that to kids to say, okay, if, if you want to learn something, get into, uh, you know, physical groups. I think we have to take, take a step back here. That's what I'm trying to say. Yeah, it- Okay. Yeah, it's and, about uh, the risk and an opportunity in yeah. a very concrete way. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. I mean, let's make no mistake. Uh, uh, the AI is able, and we do have an example today. AI is able to manipulate the unprepared human, right? Mm. So we, uh, you can just kind of a little bit YouTube, and then you will find some examples. Definitely, uh, we do have these examples. So. Uh, Let's prepare the people because the key word here is unprepared the human, right? So uh, they are able to manipulate unprepared human. Mm-hmm. So let's prepare them because it's AI is uh, luckily or unfortunately just a reality. So we have to uh, to learn how to live with it, mm-hmm. right? And I think especially what really, really, again, another thing that really scares me personally as well is, again, the information that kids are uploading online without really knowing and this very cool applications based on the AI that are actually, you know, using your information, storing that information and using this for a very bad purpose as well. I, I mean, do you remember, I think um, it, it was also the thing in, in Finland and in Denmark as well, that there was this AI application that you had to upload like 10 pictures of yourself and it made you like a cartoon. Uh, kind of a ble- not a player, but I don't know even how to call that. An act, uh, like, uh, uh, yeah, you were like an actor in a cartoon, and then everybody and a lot of kids were like uploading a lot of their own like selfies and pictures and everything, and that went straight away to China, where they're actually really using these pictures not for a good uh, good purpose. So, in, in terms of this as well, like, you know, are we are we dealing this enough today? Because I, I or like again. Should there be more of the things that we should do either from the government side, more of a campaign and going to the schools, having the lectures, like talking about these kind of a case studies? And I don't know, even like getting closer to the uh, to the students by using their social like influencers uh, that are talking about these cases and raising their awareness what not to do uh, in order to lose your information and not to even speak about like, you know, uh, parents that are uploading pictures of their half naked kids and, and then they go somewhere uh, again uh, that can be very much used against their uh, their kids uh, in the future. Well, if you're asking, I mean, are we dealing enough with that? So we never n- do, yeah. It's never <laughs> enough, right? So it's yeah. never enough. And AI is uh, is uh, developing as we speak. Mm-hmm. So China as AI superpower, let's make no mistake. Mm-hmm. I mean, a- China today is AI superpower. So they are developing as we speak. So uh, there is never enough. But still, even in that situation, every single day, every single minute, you have mm-hmm. to deal with that and you have to explain to the kids, I mean, what are those dangers? What you have to have mentioned mm-hmm. here and so on and so on. Yeah. I think there's another side of this. So on one hand, it's like this extremely private information of small children that can be used for heinous, heinous things. But it's also like their their um, IP rights. Like if a child uh, produces a great story, and you know the teacher uses an AI checker, you know, yeah. was this AI? No, it wasn't. It turns out this kid's a genius and <laughs> is yeah. going to make millions one day, writing awesome books but then the kid can't do it because all of it's <laughs> all of their creativity is already in, ingested into the algorithms and the algorithms will do that in in the future for them so kind of understanding that there are many aspects of the kids uh, pri- private data personal data um, that that we need to protect and that the teacher really is at a has has to have a role in there mm. because the kids don't necessarily have a voice and like I don't want to do that <laughs> it feels too I don't want to give my data there I don't want to do that kids can't usually object to this it's part of the classroom activity so we need teachers much more aware of, of this uh, than they are today unfortunately and that's hard work to do well <laughs> one example is that uh, for a few weeks back we had a presentation for for young kids in the school. And uh, one of these presentations was actually recording five minutes of voice, five minutes of video, and you can manipulate that. And you couldn't barely see the difference. 
uh, I created the video and I also created the, the voice. One of my colleagues, he, he synthesized that so you can create fake videos within the, your palm of your hand within five, ten minutes, yeah. and then you're set off. And I think that is actually a problem because if, if a lot of the young kids out there, they upload videos, and especially on TikTok, yeah. can that be manipulated? The, the short word it would be yes, uh, with no questions asked. Yeah. Lars, but what do you think, I mean, what we can do in that situation? What I think that, that education, and, and actually, in my experience, I think if we should po show a problem, we should be able to show the problem so people can see, okay, what are we against here? Because when we talk about AI, we haven't seen the top of the iceberg, but if we can find areas where we can pick out to say, okay, this is the problem, mm -hmm. and, and showcase that somehow, I think that, that uh, opens the eyes for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And kind of like also making sure that our our kids and students are a bit more suspicious also of the information that they, they see online. And, and, and this kind of a critical thinking, I think, is, is something. But, but again, that's why we need the case studies to actually show that this information that you saw wasn't actually correct and, 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 and these case studies can work. I'm, I'm taking the last question that we have received from the audience and then we will wrap it up and everybody you know, can go and enjoy some lunch time as well. Um, so you, uh, Oleg, talked about, the, again, China as a superpower. Nobody has a question that they are in, in AI, but you know, not maybe the society that we would want to uh, be in terms of like respect to our, our, our data and our, our rights. Um, so there was a follow-up question on that side as well, that regulation is a defensive method. Uh, innovation is power. China and the US have it. Uh, the EU doesn't really. Is education so much different also between the US and the EU and maybe also including China here as well? Is anybody, because I was thinking when I saw that question, I don't have any, any idea how they are teaching maybe also, you know, AI and, 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 and tech in schools in China, but, uh, but it's when we think about innovation, technology, uh, the education in the US, you mentioned before, Maria, that you think that we are even a bit better, uh, but um, any, any idea uh, or, or knowledge, how, how does it work in, in China or, or more maybe somewhere else in the US as well? Well, when I'm saying that, that China is superpower in terms of AI, I mean rather kind of these base technologies. Yeah. So I have no clue, honestly, okay. how Neither. they are tackling this topic in terms of education yeah. today. Uh, but I'm pretty confident that, that they have certain approaches there. So uh, and we have to uh, be aware of that. Uh, with regards to the US and rather kind of uh, in the same layer where Maria is. So uh, at least as far as I have heard, uh, they don't have any centralized approach there. So there are uh, some of the pretty good initiatives. I know that in, uh, in the state of Washington, for example, they have pretty good initiatives in, uh, in certain schools, mostly in private schools, what I have heard of, uh, but there are no centralized approach. So I think that here, rather, both in regulation and, both, uh, and in understanding, I mean, how to tackle this in general education, I think that we are quite in, quite in forefront right now. Exactly, and we have really, really impressive EU-wide collaborations as mm. well. One of one of the examples in the cyber education space is the Cyber Citizen Initiative, mm. which involves uh, several EU countries together working on citizen education in cyber. Or even like the Finland and, and Estonia are even sharing the spaces of AI, like a, a free course that you can do online. Also, uh, again, together with between the University of I think Helsinki or and and, and Estonia yeah. as well. So that's exactly. also like a good example. Well, the last initiative that I've heard of is that having an attitude towards AI. Uh, we can look for ENISA here in Europe. That is the, mm -hmm. the security agency we have here in Europe. They actually have uh, guidelines on, on how to regulate that and, yeah. and control that in, in companies. So it's worth having a look at. All right, but then uh, let's wrap it up uh, so that everybody can take a bit of a break, uh, think about what you heard here, and then again, uh, what would be your contribution in that sector to really make sure that we have enough knowledge about use of AI and, and, and cybersecurity and how to really take more of this as a, as a chance for opportunities uh, and, and not so much on, on the big threat that is, is facing us.